Hello everyone and welcome to episode number two on the Man to Man podcast. I'm your executive producer and host, Hugo Ribatikam. Conversation today, I have Gary Tittinger. Gary, thanks so much for making time. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you for the opportunity. Bangi Mahashula, great to see you. Thank you, Yux. Great to be here. So, so this conversation that I'd like us to have, gentlemen, is about the workplace, uh, mental health in, 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 in particular, and certainly the experiences that, that we've had. I mean, when you look at the statistics around suicide um, amongst men in particular, it's way higher than you, you'd expect. I think it's almost two-thirds of all suicides are committed by, by men, if, if you will. So let's unpack that workplace, uh, maybe starting off with you, Gary. What, what are some of the experiences um, that, that men go through, experiences that you've gone through in the, in the workplace that, that certainly need to be checked? You go, yeah. So, the, I, I mean, talking from personal experience, uh, I, I remember working in an environment where I thought everything, and literally everything was flying. It was going so well. Uh, I was in a senior executive position and we were making great decisions and the business was flying. And uh, the MD at the time decided to immigrate and there was this change in leadership and uh, everything kind of went belly up from mm. there. So I went from this position where I thought everything was uh, under control and I was, I was really having fun and I felt valued and I felt like the, the decisions I made were important and we were making a real difference. And then the dynamic changed and new people came into the business and all of a sudden I didn't feel like I was welcomed in that space because there was this new, you know, kind of new leadership team and I was ostracized. I felt like I was ostracized. And at the same time, the, 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 there was this new, let's call it competitiveness, uh, jostling for position and backstabbing and meetings behind the doors. And man, that just, it, it, it threw me. I just, I, I, I had no idea how to cope with that situation. I remember coming back to work after taking a few days off and I, I, I had a start develop. I literally couldn't see. I had... My, my body was reacting mm. in a way that that I was unused. I, I wasn't used to. I didn't. I didn't know where I was coming from, and it was literally the manifestation of all of this, I suppose, fear and uncertainty that I was carrying in me, uh, and there was no release. I had no. I mean, I could talk to my wife, but all I was doing was sharing uh, my fears with, her, and it wasn't really helping. So, I've been in that space where this the, the the dynamic changes, and then when you when you don't have someone to talk to, and then you bottling it up inside. Very, very unhealthy situation. So in a moment we'll come to how you eventually dealt with it and obviously what are some of the key lessons that have been learned from that. But uh, Bangi, your, your own experiences? Yeah, uh, thanks Hugo. Almost similar to what Gary was saying. I was fairly young, uh, professional at that point. Uh, you know, career going the right way, uh, as planned at least. And uh, when I got to the small little consulting company, uh, after a year or so, the business wasn't doing well. Again, as Gary was saying, changes to the business itself, changes to the partnership of the business. I hadn't made partner yet at that point, uh, you know, and uh, my side of the business uh, had to be closed down. Yeah? And unfortunately for my sins, I was given the task to retrench uh, about 12 people in my team. And I was told, uh, without mentioning the words that the thirteenth letter it's you. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I thought uh, that was the toughest mm. thing I had to do in my life. Uh, you know, from a support perspective at that point I was a single young man and uh, my sister who's still alive, who's still my support system today, yeah, I had to go reach out to her and say this is a situation I'm faced with. Uh, you know, how do I do this? Uh, through her help, her guidance and stuff you know, we managed to get through it. But at that point, it was extremely difficult for a young, growing professional. Uh, just when you think you're getting there, you know, and then you get hit by this. Mm. And, uh, and that was it. You know. So what, what were the emotions that you went through? And there were mixed emotions. Hey, you know, there were absolutely, why did I, what did I do so wrong? 
as a lead in that the department uh, that we couldn't get out of there and get more business and grow the team and make revenue, make our numbers and targets and stuff. But the emotions were all over the place. Like inadequacy, you know, and that was the first one. Disappointment, the second one. Failure, you know, the third one. And failing the team that I was mm. quite close to, who are the guys that I've actually personally recruited into the business. And in 18 months, I had to let them go as well. And some of the people were, had more, bigger responsibilities than me. And some of the people at that time had families, children, and school, and, and, and those type of things. So it was quite difficult. It was really, really difficult. Uh, but yeah, with God's gr uh, grace, we managed to go through it. Well, you talk about a structure, and you, and you had your, your sister to, to support you. Gary, did you have a similar structure? I mean, you, you talked about your, your wife, uh, and obviously, I'd like to think that those of us that are married or in that sort of relationship or have partners would, would go to, to the partners. But sometimes you need a structure that's just bigger than those that are in your immediate space. You do, you go. And I think uh, it was a learning for me where I didn't have that structure. I didn't mm -hmm. have, I had friends and we have friends, we've got colleagues. And, 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 uh, but when it comes to, to, to deep conversations and when, when you really need to kind of expose your, 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 your fears and, 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 and really get, get deep, uh, you, you, you need a trust relationship. And, and I, I think at, 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 at that point, probably my friendship network was mainly work colleagues mm. and that's where the space uh, you know where, where the uncertainty was and and that complete lack of trust uh, in, in terms of who you could talk to and who you could trust uh, I felt exposed and and, and I, I had to make an intentional decision to, to kind of f going forward in the future find ways of having those conversations or, or people to have conversations with uh, I, I literally remember uh, there was a whole lot of stuff that, that, that went wrong at the same time. And I remember just like kind of standing outside, looking up, uh, and, and, and I was probably crying and, and just thinking, you know, like, who, who, who do I share this with? Mm. Uh, who, like, how am I going to, uh, I, I suppose if you've got a, a church that you can go to and church leaders, uh, th that would be helpful. I'm I, 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 not a church-going person, uh, and, and as a result, I didn't have that additional network to go to. So, yeah, it was it, it was a very very difficult time uh, for me in that space, and uh, not having the trust relationships that I mm. needed to be able to. Uh, because you also want advice. You want to. It's not just about talking. It's about getting some advice, getting some guidance. Now, let's talk about both of you are in in, in corporate and in, in high positions, and and with that, uh, obviously, is is a huge amount of uh, workload. And, and the need to, to balance, you know, your, your work life and your, and your social life. Uh, Gary, I know your, your kids are, are, are grown now, but... You wouldn't say so looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> De Definitely not. <laughs> Bit of a spring chicken. But, but what's that balance like? I mean, how do you, how do you strike that balance? Because there's, there's a huge amount of, of, of pressure. Mm. Uh, but is there... Are there systems in place to be able to to release or, or blow off some some steam? I tell you, I, I learned something from my daughter. Mm. Uh, she actually happens to work in the wellness space, and I was talking to her about balance, about uh, uh, this term work life balance, and she corrected me. She said, "You know, uh, it's nowadays it's actually more about work life integration." Mm. So, as we used to talk about trying to balance uh, the, the difference, we found that our work has integrated into our lives so much that there isn't necessarily a full separation. I was never able to go on leave and just stop thinking about work because you knew you were going back to it. And also in a competitive environment, if you're away too long, then you're not needed. Mm. You know, so there's always somebody, <laughs> somebody looking to, t so, so you only take short bits of, of time. But I think the, 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 the trick is to, is, is, is to find this, uh, a balanced integration of of uh, kind of work and uh, work and play, and what I've done is I've found I've I've looked for opportunities where I can actually do stuff that I enjoy, but that that helps me at work as mm. well. So that's where I think integration comes in. So, for example, public speaking and 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 uh, uh, doing Toastmasters and and, and uh, speaking contests uh, is something that I really enjoy doing, but I find I benefit from it at work as well. 
So there's those opportunities. That's what I think integration is. And for you, Bangi? Yeah, I like the term uh, work-life integration and balance, to be quite honest. For me, what's personal is I need to find time for my kids. Mm, mm. You know, I'm, 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 I'm very passionate about being there. Uh, f growing up, my dad was always there. Mm. You know, my mom was always there, fortunately, and I always wanted to do one better than my dad. Mm -hmm. So what I do is with my daughter, who's seven, is uh, school runs are my runs in the morning. I don't care what meetings I have to, mm -hmm. you know, we, I work for a company with a global presence and sometimes the Australians want us to be at work at around 7 or 6.30 or so. But when it's time to, to drop off my daughter to the, at school, that is our time. That's our bond time. Uh, and, and Gary, I like what you're saying. And that's exactly what I do as well. Is I can go and leave, but I still take my laptop. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, I do all of these things. I give time for, 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 for that stuff. I don't know if the wives like it though. <laughs> yeah, you keep the wives busy as well, take them to your massage, to, uh, to a spa, and then they will, give you, they will give you a bit of space. It might be difficult for them to say, you know, why are you taking your laptop to, to work? But that's the nature of the responsibilities that we have at work. We cannot, I can, I can speak for myself, I can personally not just switch off work. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, there's just too much that I need to do. Yeah. And, and take time, but it's it's again making time, dedicating time yeah. uh, to what you enjoy, to what you love. And you know, my friends say that nowadays I'm boring, especially after my one-year-old son was born. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm more boring, and I'm happy to be boring. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to be boring. I don't think my son thinks the same thing, or my daughter thinks the same thing. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I love being with them, an extended member of the family. So, you know, and hosting people in my own house, or they're very close uh, uh, family and friends, you know, in their pl 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 places of comfort. Um, when I was younger, yeah, I didn't mm. care. The <laughs> pub was my b best place to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now yeah. home is yes. my best place yeah. to be. Yeah. Amazing how it changes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Gary, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. We are going to carry on uh, in a moment with uh, Rob Mokombe, who's going to pick up where Gary left off. But great having you on this episode of uh, Man to Man. Thank you, Hugo. And uh, what a great platform. I mean, I, yeah. I could have used this platform a number of years ago. I think I came out of it okay, <laughs> but I probably would have been better off uh, had I had a platform for like so. Great initiative. Thanks. Yeah, See you absolutely. soon. Gary, thanks very much. Rob, welcome. Delighted if you could join us on Man to Man. Thank you, Hugo, and uh, thank you for extending the invitation. This is a great platform. I'm really excited to be here. Well, appreciate it. You've obviously yeah. been uh, the fly on the wall, so to speak, and you've, you've picked up on this conversation that, we, mm -hmm. that we're having uh, around the, the workplace, particularly, mm -hmm. and striking that, that balance. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary talked about work-life Mm -hmm. integration mm -hmm. what are your own experiences been around balancing work life and your social life or family life excellent point and i love the wisdom that um you know gary's taught uh, you know about the integration of the mm. work and the life space so i thought i'd step back a little bit i'm not um prof i'm not an expert in uh, mental health um, I'm a, my background is in the health uh, services. And I thought maybe for us to have a good grasp of what mental health is. Mm. And, um, you know, WHO defines it as a place where you've got, uh, you know, the mental well-being for someone to actually contribute to life, enjoy life, learn and work well. Um, and it, and it's, it's a human right. So when I think of that integration, it's, uh, I love the, 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 the concept of the integration because really often it's very hard to separate them. Mm. So the thing is... Um, what happens at work affects what happens at home and vice versa. And so having that right uh, mix in a way, and it can differ with different people, different seasons of our lives, um, different situations, even in the same occupation. So for me, I love the point that have come up from what Bangi and, and Gary are saying, you know, you know, a lot of it is around relationships, you know, 
what do you prioritize in, in your life? What do you think is really important? And you find that in most of these places, family, um, you know, close friends, and close ties come in. I loved also what uh, Gary was saying about, uh, you know, public speaking and all those kind of things. So learning something that can also sometimes take your mind away from work mm. and build other areas because health is like, if you think of physical health, it's everything from head to toe. And so you can find things that you can actually enjoy. So I love, you know, I, I've been into hobbies. My wife is, uh, she's very much into gardening, landscaping and construction. Mm. I find myself getting drawn into that space. Um, you know, learning a new instrument, whether you want to play, you want to sing. So those kind of things that you can look at as well. But also taking time off. Um, Bang, I hear you. You know, sometimes it's very hard to tear yourself away from work, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but sometimes trying to find a space actually where you can try and have a bit more separation. If you can, obviously it differs from place to place. So I think from my experience, especially coming out of COVID-19, uh, we're still there, I know. But um, I think those are some of the things that we've picked up. We've seen in the, in the workplace that actually seem to make a difference in people's lives. Well, there's, there's a statement, there's a new phrase that, that came out called COVID babies, right? And that's obviously because a lot of people spend a lot of time uh, at home and a lot of that time resulted in, uh, in offspring. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Now... The, the challenge, Bangi, and, th and this is for you, stems from the fact that you've, you've spent so much time at home uh, with, with your wife and, and family, right, that they've come accustomed for, for three years to seeing you uh, every day almost 24-7, uh, so to yeah. speak. But now you've got to go to work. What are those conversations uh, that we're having at home or should be having, and what are the implications of... I mean, your, your son's a year old. He's used to seeing daddy at home every day. And all of a sudden, there's, there's distance because you, you're out at, at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you're back at, yeah. at, at 7 p.m., for instance. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Hugo. So I think the toughest conversation was with my daughter mm -hmm. rather than the young one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, living in a small space at the time, uh, where you see each other in each other's face, uh, you know, the separation that she has to do some school work from time to time, I have to do some work most of the time. My wife also, you know, doing her own work. Uh, she's self-employed, which mm. and her business at that point was starting to grow. And then boom, COVID happened and everything stopped. So it's, uh, emotionally, I had to be there for her. Uh, to say, you know, this is temporary like everything else in life, and uh, this, this also shall pass. So emotionally had to be there for her while I'm in her face, mm. and, you know, have, then I have to do my own work mm -hmm. and make sure that when I have these sessions or teams meetings, everybody goes to the room mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. and give me that space. But when I went back to work, uh, you know, I was a little bit fortunate that my daughter also had to go back to, work, to school. And I said to her, listen, we have, things are different now. You can't be touching your friends, doing this. You have to wear masks and all of those things. And uh, we're not going to be seeing each other like we have been playing with each other every day, you know, after doing schoolwork and after doing work. Um, and, and she understood. Uh, it took a bit of uh, uh, sitting down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with her and my wife, explaining to her what is COVID-19 number one. You know, why, is, you know, uh, we have to have these lockdowns and the separations. And after a little bit of the restrictions, uh, after all some restrictions were lifted, you know, she had to go back to school. And now change of mind, change of the way everything happens in, in the world. Uh, we have to tell a, a teacher new tendencies, mm -hmm. new healthier tendencies. Mm -hmm. So it, the discussions with my wife and her involved made it a bit easier for us, you know, to engage. Well, the little one still follows me everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. So even try to go to the bathroom, the little guy is there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's always a problem when mm -hmm. I have to go to work because mm -hmm. I need to put her very far mm -hmm. and run, to, you know, to my car mm -hmm. so that it doesn't <laughs> see me, you know. Yeah. But I find it extremely uh, satisfying, you know, mm -hmm. in a weird way that mm -hmm. this guy is like my little shadow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but for him, it's not really a big problem because he hasn't comprehended it yet. Mm -hmm. Rob, let's talk about stigma associated with yeah. uh, mental uh, health, mm -hmm. and and whether or not it's is one of the factors that 
results in men not talking about challenges in the in the workplace in particular absolutely and in the first um, um, session you had I think the, the term toxic masculinity was mentioned but just looking at stigma in mental health it has always been there um, yeah. I think the found uh, of people who were recovering uh, from a mental health disorder which is different from just mental health in general mm. that up to maybe three quarters of them did not want to reveal when they went back to work that they'd had a mental health issue. And for most of them, they felt one, about half of them felt there'd be discrimination. People see them differently, treat them differently um, in a way that is negative. And um, about a quarter of them also felt that even if they disclosed that they had a, had a mental health um, problem, they will not get any support. Yeah, so, yeah, when, so when you look at the, at the mm. stigma, it's because, it's, it's especially in our culture, um, but yes, I know it may be more pronounced in some cultures and we can talk of African culture, but generally as men, we, we have this view that to admit um, a problem uh, and the mental health problem maybe is a reflection of weakness. Mm, but, but nobody thinks of that if I've got high blood pressure or uh, some, I've got a diagnosis of cancer or I'm getting you know, treated for TB, you, you look at it differently. But if you say mental health, it's sort of like clouded as almost it's a, it's a sign of a weakness and it is not. And part of what you should be doing is actually to normalize treatment for mental health, just like you would someone who's had a fracture. You know, mm -hmm. the same way you'd want to make accommodation for them getting access into the office. So it should be for me if I've also got a mental health problem that I've been treated for. So yes, the stigma is a big problem. And, um, and the workplace is quite critical. We have labels, we have hierarchies, the CEO, head of this department, COO, you name it. And um, that in itself also plays a role in how I may perceive myself. And if somebody sees me as somebody in this particular level who's got a mental health problem, then already you may find that in that space, the way mm. you react, the way you relate with people, it's very different and it can be very uncomfortable. And, you know, hearing what was coming out of the pressure that coming from all angles, it really adds more to the stress mm. that somebody might already have. Rob, you, you work mm. for a multinational. So let's yes. talk about best practice. You know, I mean, let's, right. let's not even theorize. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what's happening in, in your workspace, right. right, before Bangi equips in, as to what are those structures that have been put in place by obviously a, an experienced uh, multinational right. to ensure that if, if men have a problem mm -hmm. uh, around mental health right. that they're adequately catered to. Excellent point, you. And I think, you know, corporates and companies have become much more um, forthright and intentional. Mm. We always had these uh, employment um, employee assistant programs, you know, EAPs. And, and where they come from is really, in the old days, they were like trying to help people cope with things like maybe alcoholism or, you know, coming from trauma. But they've expanded into all areas of life because it's recognized what happens with my family. If I'm getting married, I'm getting divorced or something has happened. You have to, to help me cope with that. So you put mm. structures in place. You have policies that are very clear. Uh, you know, especially around issues of, you know, discrimination, um, equity, diverse, diversity and inclusion. You want to make sure that you actually cover everybody. And then you also have to have the, the leaders walk in the talk, hmm. you know, so, you know, CEOs, the, 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 the managers being vulnerable and vulnerability is a strength. But I think for men, sometimes we see it as, as opposite, hmm. opening up, creating a platform where the culture in that organization is that people know that they can actually reveal what problems they might have. There are opportunities for them to, to, to get help, whether they are through supported you know, benefits from the company or through other organizations can come in and help their employees and then creating platforms. Um, you know, in my organization, I'm based here in South Africa. We work internationally. We had regular platforms during the COVID-19 where we'd talk, what is covid what is happening? We hear from different aspects. How do you cope with the traditional aspects? How do you support? You know, what structures do you have? And then you also have opportunities to share what people are going through. And, uh, and that sharing platform of my challenges, of my fears, is very empowering. And you have this as part of the ethos, as part of the culture. And that in itself can have a role to play. Having said that, though, mm. um, they find that a lot of companies that have EAPs, their employees don't often take them up. And that is sometimes a challenge. So in trust theory, <laughs> I suppose yeah. that, that, that also could be a, a, mm -hmm. a trust issue, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to think. But, yeah. but Bangi, I, I want to mm -hmm. come back to you because you've, you've mm -hmm. talked a lot about uh, your, your one-year-old and your and your soon-to-be to eight-year-old, mm -hmm. right? Now, as, as an executive, there's obviously 
integration that we've talked about, which is which is a new term for for some of us. But that balance. For me too, I just heard it from Gary. Yeah, but that balance. How are you managing that? I mean, what's the practical side to? I mean, what's what's that formula that ensures that uh, your your little boy who's one has got enough time uh, with you, as yeah. does your as does your eight year old, and obviously you you have a wife who's yeah. who's demanding. But while she's demanding of your time, she's also demanding of the of the finer things in life, <laughs> which means that you got to spend yeah. a, a certain amount, a huge amount of time working. Yeah. That's a good one as well. But uh, before I answer that one, you go, I want to go back to what Robert said. In fact, on Wednesday uh, at our office, we had a gentleman, Stanley Bongwe. He's a CEO of Diversity Institute. Mm. Uh, uh, what a great talk. Mm. You know, and one of the key things that he spoke about on, 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 on Wednesday uh, in that session, in that workshop, it was, it was around inclusivity means giving a platform for men women, children, blind people, white people, black people, mm -hmm. to have their own point of view based on their uh, identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we acknowledge it, whether you agree or not agree with it, it's how you deal with it, but mm -hmm. you acknowledge that existence of the, uh, or thereof. And he went back to speak about men being intentional mm -hmm. about their health, about their mental health. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, whether you, you say to your partners or your doctors, most men, especially black men, mm -hmm. don't see psychologists, psychiatrists, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. They probably speak to their friends over a beer mm -hmm. and they think that is enough. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not enough. They are not professional in that space to get your, your, your mental their posture right. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So it's important for us, and, and I learned that, which I'm going to carry forward, is that I, it doesn't make me a weaker man to speak to a, to a psychiatrist yeah. or to a psychologist about main issues mm -hmm. and stresses. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, to be, a, to, pro, to be able to provide to the family, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to find the things that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that if they cannot happen, they cannot happen. Mm -hmm. But again, if you have to now answer you is, it's about being intentional, mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm not delusional in that sense, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm not delusional in making time, uh, specifically for, uh, for the wife. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, with the support system around our, my household, mm -hmm. which is the help that uh, the ladies in the house give us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to spend a couple of hours with my wife, just mm -hmm. the two of us, mm -hmm. and they'll take care of the house. Mm -hmm. Uh, while we don't and the kids while we're not there mm -hmm. so so it's that date for example date night mm -hmm. stuff that my wife and i do uh, my kids my, my my daughter is a, she's a great swimmer mm -hmm. uh, but she damn sucks in netball eh? mm. and she loves it <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i'll go to the netball games mm -hmm. and watch her i remember we went to had to be a sport down there we were playing against picking hood and, and they got hammered, eh? They got hammered by that school and I had to go back and say, hey, listen, uh, maybe this is not for you, girl. <laughs> you know, stick to swimming. <laughs> uh, those are the type of things that mm -hmm. I, 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 I like doing, mm -hmm. make time for, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for example, a bath time for my son is my favorite thing to mm -hmm. do. Uh, before, she, before he goes to sleep, I'm the guy who gives him a bath. Uh, or help, help, try to help give him back. I can't control him nowadays. Mm. Uh, you know, he's getting bigger and all violent with me. Uh, so I need the entire household to constrain him. Uh, yeah, but it's being intentional with your time mm -hmm. and uh, being intentional with how you, you, you spend time with your kids and, and the whole family. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you go, one other thing that I do religiously is homework with my eight year old. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's, it's not just spending time with her, uh, but it's also uh, understanding where she is academically, seeing the progress or no progress or et cetera, and engaging with her about what might be the reasons she's struggling there or excelling there. It's being intentional with your time. Now, gentlemen, as we, as we wrap up, uh, two issues I'd like us to, to focus on. I'm going to give you 60 seconds, uh, mm -hmm. Rob. And that's... Uh, Preventing burnout. Now, preventing burnout also speaks to the amount of resilience that you that you can build. Yeah. So, walk us through that very quickly. If you want. So, I think preventing burnout 
there's some key things you have to know. You can only do so much. So train yourself to say no. Put boundaries. Mm. Um, you know, at my workplace, we actually have an email little signature that says, I'm replying to this email at hours that work for me. And I expect mm. you to also respond in the hours that work for you. And with a global organization, it's important. So you have to set boundaries. Um, so at least you don't let the work encroach too much into mm. your home life. So the other thing as well, in terms of re building resilience, relationships in hearing, you know, hobbies, um, relaxation, um, taking time to even just go for a walk, um, you know, meditating, fellowshipping with colleagues, all those kind of things and sharing your issues. I think they help us to build resilience and to know that you're not just alone, that there are others walking through what you're walking through and they've picked up some lessons that you can pick up from. And of course, seeking professional help as and when you, you need to have that. So I think it's, it's important to have that um, in, this, uh, in this space um, to try and avoid that burnout, um, which will then feed into that vicious mm. cycle if you need, you know, if, 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 if you like. Yeah. And Bangi, how are you building yeah. resilience and preventing burnout? I, I'll, I'll share the same sentiments. You know, like I, I don't want to regurgitate what I've said about being intentional with town. But for me, uh, I'm a sports fanatic. Mm -hmm. I really love sports. Mm -hmm. I love rugby. Mm -hmm. I used to play back in school. Mm -hmm. I love uh, f football. Man United supporter. Orlando how how sad. I know, I heard <laughs> since talking, interviewed by Liverpool. I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> but um, that's, that's the type of thing that for me, I, I do those things and mm -hmm. I get relaxed. I might not be relaxed when the game is going on because <laughs> I'll be shouting and screaming. But that shouting and screaming relaxes me. You know, it relaxes my mind and everything. Uh, I like reading quite a bit as well. You know, I'm a very political person. I like reading uh, b political autobiographies and stuff. And 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 I, I want to know how to fix watches. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Robin Bungie, appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being a part of Man to Man in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hugo. There's lots Thanks to be you. done and great job. No, it's a great platform. Mm -hmm. It's well long overdue. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, all the best in it. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Fantastic. Thanks again for being a part of episode number two of Man to Man podcast. I'm Hugo Robertica. Look forward to seeing you again on the very same platform at the same time. And remember, let's do better.